All right. So what I want to do today is get through protists. So we'll go back to chapter 23. Um, we made it through some of the early introduction stuff about characteristics of the group. Um, and uh, we talked about endless symbiotic theory a little bit. I want you guys to pick up the rest of the discussion. We talked about um, characteristics of eukaryotes. This is where we left off. So I'm actually going to mute this display for a one now. Because I want you guys to toss out for me characteristics of eukaryotes without looking at this one. So that's down. What is something from that list? You can look at your notes, you can look at your book, you can look at the PowerPoints if you have them with you or on your computer. But just tell me, like, what, what makes a eukaryote a eukaryote? <laughs> Nucleus, right? So ding, 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 number one. Number one on the list, that's the one you've already known since like seventh grade. Right? We're learning about it in more uh, detail now, but that's the sort of big one. That's what eukaryote means, right? True nucleus. You guys remember that? Um, what else? Eukaryotes have? Sometimes. Always. Are they always multicellular? They're not, right? So a lot of these groups, which we haven't gone through yet, but we're going to touch on today, are single cell eukaryotes. So you can have a complex cell that is the whole organism. Okay, so things like yeast. Well, that's gonna be fun, guys. Right? I'm jumping ahead to the next to the next chapter, but that's a single cell eukaryote. Lots of things that are classified as protists are single cell eukaryotes. Um, what are the characteristics you find in the eukaryotic cell? Yeah. Membrane-bound organelles. Membrane-bound organelles. Like what? Mitochondria. That's the next one on the list, right? So you find mitochondria specifically. And if you don't find a whole functioning mitochondrion inside of a eukaryotic cell, you might find remnants. Right? We talked about that. So there are some protists, some eukaryotes that have um, remnant or vestigial mitochondria. They don't need them anymore. They're not making their own ATP because they're living how? Do you remember? Parasitically. Yeah. So they're getting their energy, their nutrition from a host. So they may not need those mitochondria. In that case, we're talking about a secondary loss of that characteristic. So how do we know that these characteristics, or why do we think that these characteristics that we talked about, I'll pop the slide back up since we've reviewed some of what I wanted to talk about. Remember that you need to know all of these, okay? So you need to be familiar with all of those as characteristics of eukaryotes. But how do we know that this is, um, this is an ancestral condition, the possession of these characteristics? How do we know that the, what we would consider to be the ancestor of all eukaryotes, or Lika, last eukaryotic common ancestor, why would we think that um, that ancestor had all these things? Do you remember? I'm going to skip forward to the tree so we can start talking about that. It's because all of these groups have members that have those characteristics, right? So when we're talking about these, um, Conclusions. I'm getting out my other one. Just one to the corner. Oh no, now this one becomes battery in it. That's not good. All right. Oh, I'm, I'm like crippled without my pen. Ooh, there's a stick. <laughs> <laughs> this is what we used before there were electronic laser pointers. Just sticks. All right. So when we're talking about these characteristics, when we're talking about these um, derived traits, each one of these groups. That we, that we sort of subdivide protists into have members in those groups that have these characteristics. So when we're talking about derived traits, we're talking about making conclusions about uh, where traits came in. When we're talking about parsimony, we're gonna keep using that term. What is parsimony? Do you guys remember? This is the most parsimonious explanation for something. That's the simplest, okay? So parsimony just means the easiest explanation. The explanation that requires the least uh, events, the least number of events, right? the fewest things that have to happen. So what I mean by that is that if you see members of all of these major subdivisions in the kingdom of protists, okay, which we're going to talk about today, if you see members from each of these groups that all share those characteristics, it is simpler, more parsimonious to understand that that probably happened here. That those traits arrived here in the common eukaryotic ancestor and they all inherited those traits the nucleus 
mitochondria, uh, sexual reproduction, mitosis, meiosis, things like that, right? So that the all of for all for all of those characteristics to appear in all of these lineages, it makes more sense that they would have inherited from a common ancestor than they would have all evolved them independently or convergently. Does that make sense? And that was like a lot. And you're kind of looking at me funny, or you're not looking at me at all. <laughs> like I'm gonna call on you and ask you a question. Um yeah, but is that good? Are you guys okay with that? Yes? Okay, fantastic. So that's the idea. So we go back to this slide and it says up at the top, these characteristics were present in the common ancestor of all eukaryotes as evidenced by their presence in all those major lineages. That's what I'm talking about. Okay, the exception before we move on is remember the cell wall. So each of those major lineages have members within those groups that have cell walls, but they also have members that do not have cell walls. Okay, so this one is like the iffy characteristic on the list. Whether it was uh, an ancestral trait in the last eukaryotic common ancestor, and then the groups that don't have them now have secondarily lost them, or if the cell wall was evolved convergently numerous times in independent lineages. So this is the tricky one, cell wall, okay? But everything else on the list is, a, is for sure, as best as our evidence can tell us, that it would have appeared back here, and that's why you see it in all of these super groups. Okay, cool. All right, now we're ready to move on to some new stuff. That was all kind of review of what we talked about Monday, but I, I feel like it bears reviewing because that's a little bit complicated and it's an important uh, sort of fundament right, to what we're talking about going forward. All right, so we're switching gears. We're going to talk about these groups. We're going to look at the phylogenetic tree, and then we're going to talk about members, notable members of each of these six groups. A couple of things I want to mention about the phylogeny before we move on to that, though. Um, so prior to the advent of DNA sequencing, that's just fancy words which means before we had it, right, before we could use molecular systematics, protist relationships were determined by morphological similarities. What does that mean? What is morphological similarities? Not ancestor, morphology. Oh, size. Yeah, shape. Right, exactly. Physical characteristics. So, if you are trying to classify a single cell eukaryotic organism, or even some of the multicellular examples that we'll see in protists like seaweed, right? If you're if you're comparing, um, let's see, you guys know what amoebas are? Yeah, most of you are nodding. Um, what about paramecia? Or Euglena, the little single cell dudes that you probably used in labs before that you've seen under a microscope. They're eukaryotes, they're in these groups, but they're just single cells and you have to use a microscope to see them. If you're using uh, morphological characteristics to decide how closely related an amoeba is to a paramecium and to a Euglena, how could that be tricky, do you think? Well, they're all single cells, right? So there's only so many characteristics, morphological characteristics that you could go on. So the phylogeny of protists or organisms that are grouped as protists has changed a lot and numerous times as we get better and better at these molecular techniques that, that distinguish those relationships um, on a finer scale, on a molecular scale, using DNA, RNA, and protein sequences to figure out relationships, as opposed to comparing one single cell organism to another single cell organism to another single cell organism. So that's why that was challenging. So that's the answer to that question there, right? That morphology is limited when you're talking about single cell organisms. So molecular systematics has revealed new data that is allowing relationships based on genetic similarities to replace old ideas based on morphological similarities. That is why if you, even if you just look online at sources and you look up protists, you will see different groups different organisms classified in different ways depending upon the source you're looking at. And if you look at an old biology textbook, you'll see a totally different taxonomic system. And here's the really fun part. If you look at an even newer textbook or some more recent papers than what our textbook is based on, you will see a different type of classification than this one. Okay, so we'll talk about that a little bit. I'm not super worried about it. First of all, I don't think any of you guys are chasing a career in protist phylogeny. Am I wrong? I'm not wrong, right? I've read all your emails and no one said they were going to do this for a living. So I'm okay with that. 
Also, this is an intro class, so I'm okay with that. And we'll sort of talk about it. All right, so just keep that in mind. What I do want to just look at here is the idea that I presented to you guys early on that some protists are more closely related to other eukaryotes than they are to each other. Okay, well, what that means here is if you look, you've got six what we call supergroups, eukaryotic supergroups. Okay, so these are um, basically subdivisions or superphyla within the kingdom of Protista. You've got excavata, chrome alveolata. You guys will need to recognize these terms okay, and be able to choose them from a multiple choice list. Rhizaria, Archiplastida, Amoebozoa, and Opistopontia. So those are the six major groups. If you look at newer books or other books or other articles, you might see uh, the chromalveolus and the rhizaria grouped together in a big clade called the SAR clade or the SAR clade. So if you ever see that annotation, that's what we're talking about. Um, that includes these views on this branch, the alveolus, the cementopiles, and the rhizaria. So S A R. Okay, so that's not something you need to know, but I just want to throw it out there in case you see it in mind. Okay, so that's more um, even more recent classification than this. But the interesting thing, that's not you know super interesting, I don't think, but the interesting thing here in making the point that these are uh, not, wait for it, a monophyletic group. And okay, so protist is not monophyletic. All right, that's kind of breaking some of the rules that we talked about with phylogenetic trees. Yes? And it's not monophyletic. Let's see if you guys can figure out why it's not, why it's not monophyletic. Here's the last common eukaryotic ancestor, right? But we have groups that are not protists, but are eukaryotes. Can you guys think of examples? There are three other kingdoms that we have not covered yet of eukaryotic organisms that are not protists. What are they? What haven't we covered yet? Animals, plants, and fungi, right? Well, here's animals. You guys see that? On this branch down here, nested inside Opisthopontha, which is a super group of eukaryotes, okay? But next door to animals, sister, if you will, yes, to animals is this group here, the Coanoflagellus. And the Coanoflagellus are classified as protists. So far, so good. You guys with me? Okay. Here's fungi. That's another entire eukaryotic kingdom. Yes, mushrooms, yeasts, and the like. And right next door, sister to the fungi, are the nucleares. Well, the nucleares, my friends, are protists. Okay. Now, think back to when we were doing phylogenetic trees, and I was asking you guys to identify monophyletic groups. If I were to take, go back to this node here and circle just the opisthocons, is that monophyletic? It's not, because okay. Let me let me rephrase that. Opisthocons are monophyletic. But if you pull, if you say protists, are protists monophyletic? Are these all protists in this group? They're not, right? So if I said draw a circle around the protists and you have to start at this node here, you'd have to go like this around the nucleus, but leave out fungi, loop in the coenoflagellus, and leave out animals, right? Does that remind you guys of that graphic where I had a tree and sort of circled things in different colors? If you're leaving people out, groups out, you're not monophyletic. And that's just here in the Opisthocon. So all of these are uh, eukaryotes. Everybody in this group are protists on this list. These are all protists, so we're good there. These are still all protists. But in Archiplastida, you got red algae protists, you got chlorophyte uh, algae protists, pterophyte algae protists, but you've got plants, not protists. So once again, an example of a non monophyletic group, right? So you can't include all of these guys in one big group and call it monophyletic because it's not. So again, back to the main theme of protists, asking what aren't protists is a better question than asking what are they, right? Because it's a hodgepodge of things. They're all eukaryotes, but they don't fit in this clade with animals. They don't fit in this clade with fungi, and they don't fit in this clade with uh, land plants. But Taking it to the next step of this other statement here about the close relationship, nucleares, fungi, coenoflagellates, and animals are all fairly closely related to one another. So you've got protists, fungi, protists, animals. 
Um, but these guys are more closely related to these photos than they are to these. But in here, you've got plants, meaning these purple guys, the algae, are all more closely related to land plants than they are to other groups of protists. You guys okay? Yeah. So the point of the matter is an excavated is a protist and a nuclear is a protist. But nucleares and excavatins are distantly related to one another, whereas nucleares are sister with fungi. So there are groups of what we would call protists or classified as protists that are more closely related to other kingdoms than they are to other organisms in their own kingdom of protista. Yes? It's a lot. So make sure it's coming across clearly. All right. So what's the other thing to know about these supergroups? Is that each one of them is believed to have shared a common ancestor. So if you're coming back from this direction, finding those relationships, you've got common ancestor here, 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 and so on. Okay, so these groups are these individual groups would be monophyletic groups based on ancestry from here, but all protists are not monophyletic. All right, you'll see a, a question or two about that. So make sure that you're comfortable with it. And if you're confused, just let me know. I think we'll talk more, more later. Um, this is, did you have a question? So why do they compare them? Like why do they put them in that group if they're not related? Like you said, nuclear is related to fun, fungi. Yeah. But they're not. Well, Because they, they're not protists. Why is there not just one protist tree? Because based on relationships, that's a good question. Why isn't there just one big tree of protists and just don't put these guys yeah. on there? Does yeah. that mean just don't yeah. put fungi or animals yeah. on there at all? Or don't put plants in? Yes. The problem with that is, Molecular systematics has shown us that these guys are closely related. So even if we just use, let's just use animals and come in a flagellus, right? So these are not animals, but they, because there are other characteristics, this is something we'll get to later. There are other characteristics that make something an animal, right? That coenoflagellates don't have. Namely, in this particular instance, multicellularity. So all animals are multicellular. There are no single celled animals, but they're even even multicellular and multicellular animals are genetically more similar to coenoflagellates than coenoflagellates are to other protists. So the tree is based on molecular systematics. So they have to be included because they fit there. Now, if you're just doing a tree of non-animal, non-fungi, and non-plant eukaryotes. You could do that, but then it's not a monophyletic group. You're not including groups that should be included based on the data from molecular systematics. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Sort of. Right. Good enough for now. I mean, if they're not monophyletic groups anyway, I don't understand why they're there. Because if they're not monophyletic in the whole scheme of things, it kind of makes sense to me. Well, it's really a, a way to say how are all eukaryotes related to okay. one another. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah, that's what this tree is looking at. It's here's the common eukaryotic ancestor, and here are all the groups that have descended from that common eukaryotic ancestor. The first organism to have all those eight traits, okay. um, and that's where mm -hmm. these guys are all, all all descended from, and that's why they're all over together because they share a common ancestor. Does that help a little bit? Yeah. Okay. Guys, good. All right. Um, this is no new information. It's just a different type of tree. So if you work better, if your brain likes this type of phylogenetic tree better than that type, then there you go. That's just another thing. Okay. So no new info on that. The next things we'll do, the next few things we'll cover are these groups. All right. We're going to go down the tree. So each uh, each slide will have that color code for the group that we're talking about. All right. What I'm going to ask you guys to do is know the notable characteristics of these individual species. So you may be asked to recognize scientific names, okay? Um, if they're disease-causing organisms, I want you to know what disease are they associated with, okay? So they're pathogens. Um, other sort of notable characteristics I'll point out as we go through the list. So I will not have you do something like um, match these list of organisms to which of the six supergroups they fit in. That's silly. In my opinion, that's just memorization. It doesn't really help you right now with what you need to know for biology. But what I will do is ask you a question in terms of um, which of these excavatins causes African sleeping sickness, okay? So you see what I'm doing there? 
it's giving you more information, helping you sort of narrow down what group of organisms I'm talking about within the question itself. Okay, so it's not like I'm going to give you a list that says Trichinosoma, Euglena, and Giardia, and you have to tell me it's an excavator. That's not, that's just memorization. That's not valuable, but I'm going to use this as part of the information to help you lead you towards to answer the question that I'm getting at. Does that make sense? All right, cool. So let's look at these four um, excavators. These are the only ones you're going to have to know. Um, three are pathogens and one is not. Okay, so the first three on here can cause problems for humans. Uh, Giardia lamblia is the species that causes giardiasis. Anybody ever heard of giardiasis? You can get it from drinking uh, water that's contaminated with these parasites. They get into your intestines. Um, they are happy to set up shop there. They cause you gastrointestinal distress, including things like diarrhea, uh, sometimes vomiting, weight loss, malnutrition, things like that. Okay, so Giardia um, is, a, is an important one medically. Okay. Um, Trypanosoma brucei and Trypanosoma brucei, these two are closely related to one another, same genus, but they live in different places um, in the world. Uh, brucei is African, brucei is Central and South America. So they're endemic to those particular uh, areas. Trypanosoma brucei causes African sleeping sickness, which causes uh, nervous system damage that particularly attacks neurons. Um, it's a weirdo because it can evade your immune system by changing what it looks like on the surface. Okay, so they're single cell. Um, they get into your system uh, with the bite of an insect vector. So the PC fly is associated with the spread of uh, this particular trypanosome. Once they get in your system, they can continually produce new surface glycoproteins so that your immune cells that are wandering around looking for things get confused. So your immune system may run into it, recognize it as foreign, mount a response, and a couple of weeks later, run into something again that looks completely different. So you don't end up getting that immunity or those antibodies to this infection that you would normally because it can sort of masquerade as new, something new every couple of weeks. So it does some pretty weird stuff. Um, Trypanosoma cruzite causes chagas. Anybody ever heard of chagas? Probably not. That's good, right? The reason that you guys have never heard of these diseases is because it's not a problem here, right? These are often going to be classified as what we call uh, neglected tropical illnesses or neglected tropical diseases by the CDC because it's not an issue in every part of the world. So if you live in the United States, you're probably not likely to get chagas, although there have been some cases in recent years, um, mostly in the southwestern U.S., I think. These are also spread by bugs, uh, blood-sucking kissing bugs in this instance. That's um, fantastic, right? They're called kissing bugs who usually bite you around the mouth. So that's great. Um, this one doesn't attack neurons. This one attacks heart and digestive tissue, which causes uh, symptoms that can lead to trouble in those areas, malnutrition, heart failure, et cetera. And so what I want you to know is just the diseases that they cause, where they're from, just be able to recognize it in multiple choice format. And then finally, euglena, which we were just talking about a second ago. That's this guy. You may have seen these. These are pretty ubiquitous, commonly used in my uh, laboratory organisms. They're really neat because they're photosynthetic, but they're also heterotrophs. Okay, so these guys will photosynthesize preferentially when there's enough light to do it, but in the dark, they will eat stuff. So it's kind of an interesting metabolic strategy. Um, and the name for that is being a mixotroph. So you don't have to be a heterotroph or an autotroph. You can switch back and forth based on environmental conditions and nutrient availability and energy availability. You can be a mixotroph. And so that's the term that's probably on the study guide. I think it is. Four excavators, okay, to be familiar with. Notable mostly for the impact on human health in these cases. Grace, you've worked as a nurse, right? Have you seen any of these? Mostly tropical, so that's probably one. That's good. All right. Chrome alveolata, the next group on the list. So this is going to include a whole bunch of different things. We're not talking about examples of all of these, um, but we'll just pick and choose a few. Um, Plasmodium falciparum is a big one because it causes malaria. Now you've all heard of malaria, yes? 
Anybody never heard the word malaria before? It's a pretty big deal. Um, this one is the ultra spread by an infected mosquito, got a mosquito host. And mostly you find cases of malaria pretty commonly in sub Saharan Africa. Um, it's a, it affects your red blood cells. So it's dead, it can be deadly. Um, there are lots of different forms of plasmodium that cause malaria. There used to be a pretty bad, um, a pretty severe infection rate of malaria in the US, specifically in the southeastern United States here. Because um, you guys, if you've lived here for any length of time, you know in the summer, the mosquitoes are terrible, yes? In the southeastern United States. The reason that the CDC is in Atlanta is because before it was the CDC, it was actually a task force to um, figure out a way to eradicate those malaria spreading mosquitoes in the, in the southeastern United States. And they did it, it worked. So you don't hear about malaria in the US very often. Um, they got rid of those mosquitoes. They didn't get rid of all the mosquitoes, because obviously if you go outside on a summer night, you'll, you'll learn that quickly. Uh, but the species that specifically carries um, plasmodium falciparum is eradicated in the US. So that was a pretty successful um, endeavor. So just know what plasmodium is. Um, toxoplasma, this is an interesting species too. Um, toxoplasmosis, have you guys heard of that? Anybody heard of toxoplasmosis? Where, what do you think of when you think toxoplasmosis? Yeah, you're, if you're pregnant, don't change your cat litter box. Do you know why? What would you guess? So, okay. It's really it's right on here. So you can spread it through contaminated food or drink, but also through contact with cat feces. So if a pregnant woman shouldn't change a cat litter box, what can you guess about toxoplasmosis? Yeah, it can cross the placenta. It's bad for unborn babies, right? Um, most of the time, if you're not a pregnant woman or you're not an unborn baby, it's probably not going to cause you tremendous amounts of health problems, at least not noticeable health problems. Um, but you, it's sort of one of those things that you get and it lives there and it's like you don't even you don't even know it's there. However, there's some interesting research that's been done. Um, looking into what we call, and you guys, this is not meant to be insensitive, this is actually what they call this crazy cat lady syndrome. Anyone ever heard of crazy cat lady syndrome? It's real, you can Google it. Um, so here's the idea. This is a really interesting parasite. So Toxoplasma gondii um, is carried by any warm-blooded animal. They particularly like rodents, okay? So they do well, they complete part of their life cycle inside of uh, rodents like rats and voles and mice, okay? But for the reproductive phase of their life cycle, the Toxoplasma gondii has to do that inside of the cat's digestive system. In order to get into the cat's digestive system, the Toxoplasma can actually cause the rodents to change their behavior. So it affects their brain in such a way that the mice Let's use mice as an example, are no longer afraid of cats. Okay? Weird, right? So if you are a mouse and you smell cat urine, you are programmed instinctually to turn and go the other way, right? Because that scent is the scent of a predator. But what toxoplasma infection does in rodents is it not only makes them unafraid of the smell of cat urine. It makes them attracted to it, you guys. So instead of running away, it will go toward the smell of the cat. So you have a, a single celled protist parasite controlling the behavior of its host, causing decreased predator aversion or no fear of the predator, running towards the predator and then getting eaten by the cat. That's a pretty successful behavior evolutionarily, wouldn't you say? Isn't that weird? So even weirder is the idea that if you are infected with toxoplasma, it is possible that if it has this sort of uh, power to turn its host into a zombie right, and, and do its bidding, that there may be effects on the neurological system of a human host. Okay, you guys with me so far? So in, the, in terms of crazy cat lady syndrome, we're talking about the people that you see on like horror TV shows where they've got like 60 cats. You guys all know what I'm talking about, right? And it's unexplainable. 
because it doesn't make sense. Like, why would you live with 60 cats and you can't like buy food for yourself because you're buying cats? It's like kind of that, that crazy syndrome, right? Um, so there's actually research going on to look and see if toxoplasma has neurological effects on behavior of humans as well. And it does it in mice, does it in rodents. Weird to think about, right? That a single cell organism can have that much control over the behavior of a, of a mammal. Weird stuff. All right, told you that one was interesting, okay? All right, cool. Um, this is coming way down in interest level, unless you're really into history. Um, Mycophthora infestans is another protist, uh, chrome, chrome alveolate parasite, but this affects potato plants specifically, so not as interesting as uh, behavior modifying in, in mammals, um, but it affects potatoes. It causes their stalks and stems to decay. That's a potato from a, a, a late blight infected. That's the name of the potato disease, potato late blight um, that Phytophthora causes. We um, use pesticides to protect against this type of infection now, but if you've ever read about the Irish potato famine, you guys know what I'm talking about? If, you, if you're a fan of history or you've had history classes, Western civilization and stuff like that, you may have talked about it. In the 1800s, over a million people in Ireland died of starvation because they relied so heavily on potatoes as their crop for food. So over a million people starved to death and another million or so left the country. So a huge impact on the history of a particular population, both in Ireland and then um, in the immigration of Irish people into the US around that same time. So when we talk about bacterial infections being a, a big, uh, having a big impact on sort of history, here's a protist doing the same thing, right? Causing a major historical event just because of a particular species of proalveolate that is that attacks potato plants. So not as interesting as toxoplasma, but still, you know, notable. So remember, these are just notable examples from each of these groups. Okay, uh, two more comalveolates to mention. So dinoflagellates. Is this top group up here that encompasses a lot of different species? Um, these guys are pretty interesting because they're kind of everywhere in the water, they're generally aquatic, uh, but you find them in freshwater or marine ecosystems. They can also be mixotrophs like Euglena, they can be photosynthetic and heterotrophic. Um, they're a major component of plankton. You know what plankton is? Not the guy from SpongeBob. But kind of, right? He's he's a he's a probably a zooplankton because he's alive, like walking and talking, probably an animal. Um. Anyway, plankton are just food that floats. Tiny organisms live in the water that feed um organisms <laughs> close to the base of the food chain. Okay. So plankton are really important for um just food food pyramids. Okay. But um, dinoflagellates make up a big portion of that. These are the ones that you might have heard of that can be bioluminescent. And that's what this picture is showing you. It's not really easy to see because it's kind of small, but that's basically a wave crashing, and that is blue bioluminescence. Um, when we talk about bioluminescence, it's basically glowing. So things like fireflies and some jellyfish do this, but dinoflagellates are known for it. They're actually eco tours you can go on some places as close as like Florida, where you can go out on a on a canoe or a kayak in the night and take your hand and hit the water, and it'll glow like that. So these guys light up uh, when they're disturbed. So that's an interesting um, characteristic of some dinoflagellates. They also cause red tide. You guys ever heard of red tide? Like don't go in the water, don't eat the fish. It's basically a blue, essentially the uh, population explosion of dinoflagellates um, that generally are there, that are not in such numbers that they can cause huge amounts of problems. But when you get um, that type of population explosion that causes red tide, it's just there are so many of them uh, they're releasing these toxins that can kill fish, make the fish poisonous, other animals eat the fish, those animals become poisonous, you eat those other animals, and so on and so forth. So um, they can be they can be toxic. They can also be used as bioindicators. So if any of you guys are looking at water quality, but you want to tie it into um, biological diversity, you could look for these guys in the water. Um, using a microscope, identify the species, and some species indicate different things about the water, nutrient availability, pollution, et cetera. So that's, a, that's an interesting sort of side note. Um, diatoms are like that too. Diatoms are also from alveolates. We're not really talking about them as notable species, but those are also uh, 
used for bioindicators. So that'd be something else you could look at if you're thinking about the biological components of water quality at the lake or um, of the river. All right, the next group that I want you guys to know about are the brown algae. So there are lots of algae. If you look at this tree, you've got golden algae, brown algae, you'll see red algae, and two types of green algae going through the tree, okay? Um, so algae is kind of just a descriptive word for these types of organisms. Sometimes you'll hear dinoflagellates referred to as algae. It's kind of just like stuff in the water, produce in the water. Um, but brown algae are unique um, because they are mostly multicellular. So this is actually kind of more of an exception in the protist kingdom than the rule. So as far as uh, single cell versus multi cell. So these guys are usually big. A lot of these are what we refer to as seaweed. There are other groups of algae, red algae in particular, golden algae sometimes that are also called seaweed. So again, just a descriptive term, but just to kind of get you uh, thinking about what it is that we're talking about. Notable species, Macrocystis pyrifera or dyed kelp. This is a kelp forest. So kelp forests in the ocean, um, or in freshwater ecosystems provide uh, habitat for lots of other organisms to live in or nest in or hide in. Um, I was reading about sea otters that wrap themselves in kelp to keep from drifting away while they're sleeping. So lots of organisms use these. These guys are weird. They're the biggest uh, of all the protists, of all the organisms that are considered protists. They grow really, really fast, but they're not plants. So they don't have roots. They just hold on to the rocks and the substrate at the bottom of the ocean or the wherever they are, whatever aquatic ecosystem they're in, with a structure called hold fast, basically like a little suction cup that holds them in place. Then they grow up to the surface, and when they get to the top, they just keep growing across the surface. So they make these huge aggregations, um, which we call kelp forests, that are really good for um, other species. You can even farm these. So these guys are often grown in aquaculture or food and other chemicals that they produce. So giant kelp, pretty interesting. There's a little link to an article if you're fascinated by giant kelp, you can look at that. Um, but that's that's what cool. Those are chromalveolates. This is like interesting story day, right? I really want to have time to do a kahoot on microorganisms before the end of the class. So let me see if I can speed it up a little bit. All right, let's talk about rhizaria. This is going to be quick. There's not a lot to say. These guys don't cause you any problems. They don't cause any diseases. They don't infect plants. They don't cause food shortages. Um, you've got foraminiferans, or forams for short, and you've got radiolarians. Those are just two examples in uh, the rhizaria. The really notable thing about these is that they make interesting external protective structures. Forams use calcium carbonate, which is the same thing that you see in like seashells or aquatic uh, animals that make shells. And uh, radiolarians use silica, so it's almost like glass. So they fossilize really well, and you can find them pretty easily in the fossil record. Um, another little interesting fact, the, uh, the limestone that was used to build the pyramids in Egypt are loaded with four amp fossils. Because the rock that they used was, um, that they pulled out of the rivers and stuff was full of those four amps back in the day. So that's just kind of an interesting tip about those groups. Um, those shells that they form. So, nothing super notable about rhizarians, but you might see them in uh, archaeological digs. All right, Archaeoplastida. Um, this is an interesting group. We'll come back to this when we get to plants, which is hopefully next week um, after fungi. But Archaeoplastida are notable. This is the first group of eukaryotes where you see. Um, what? I just lost my mind for a second. Chloroplasts. So the <coughs> word plastid is used to describe chloroplasts and other organelles that uh, store pigments mostly in plant cells. Um, and what does arc mean? Do you guys know? Like archaeology or archaea, it comes from that name. It just means super old, like ancient. So archaeoplastida means old plastic. The first endosymbiotic event that led to eukaryotes containing chloroplasts as organelles happened in this lineage. So this is important for that reason. It's also important um, because land plants are in this group. So they're classified as archaeoplastida. 
And so we'll talk about the evolution of this group more when we get to land science. We'll talk about the relationship here between chlorophyte algae, pterophyte algae, and land plants. Because I know that you can um, hardly wait to talk about this debate, but there's some there's a lot of debate about whether um, these algae are also considered plants. If they're phylogenetic, uh, the systematists like to argue about things like that. But we'll talk about that more when we get to plants. So for Archiplaxa, I do want you to know that. That's what this whole um, first part of this slide is talking about, is that endosymbiotic event, where one, um, one heterotroph ingested uh, a photosynthetic bacterium, probably, that then gave rise to chloroplasts um, in all the lineages that have them now. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about secondary endosymbiosis later if we get a chance, but what I really want you to know is that this is a group where the chloroplasts originated okay, through endosymbiosis. Um, we'll talk mostly just about red algae. We may visit uh, parophytes and chloroplasts briefly on the next slide. So red algae um, are also sometimes called seaweed. You may have seen them if you've ever been to the beach. They are actually red, um, but they're photosynthetic. So they have chlorophyll, which is green, but they also have this weird red pigment called phycoerythrin, and there's more of that than there is of chlorophyll, so they look like they're red. Um, that's pretty much it. Red algae are algae that are red. Okay. I think terribly exciting there. Um, again, we'll get back to parophytes later with plants because they're the closest living relative to land plants. And why do we care about plants so much? Why is that going to be like a whole other discussion? Evolution of land plants. Do you use plants? Yeah. Yeah, but plants are so boring, but plants are super important, right? All of you are probably wearing cotton in some form or another. Um, you all probably ate something plant-based, whether you know it or not, even for the looks, right? Ultimately came from photosynthetic organisms um, and plants. So we care a lot about that. Wood, right, that we build things out of gas from our car can come from ancient plants. Um, so yeah, we'll talk more about this when we get to that, because we'll talk a lot about the evolution of land plants. So we'll skip parasites for now, but just know they're the closest relative to land plants. And the other green algae group are the chlorophytes. There are some interesting species in this group as well. Um, Volvox, that's these guys. This is a, um, a type of chlorophyte algae, and it is significant because it lives colonially and cooperates with each other. Even though they're single cell, um, they act as a team in certain circumstances. They will like sort of live inside of these matrices that they build, these little glycoprotein balls, and then they share uh, the jobs. So like some of the cells will get food, and some of the cells will work to do reproduction. So it's almost like um, a bridge between single cell and multicell, the so colonial um, algae. I'm sorry, yeah, green, colonial green algae. And then Calorpa is an interesting one too. That is this picture down here. It is notable because it does mitosis. So it divides its nucleus, but it never goes through cytokinesis. So let's think about what that must mean. You have one cell with one nucleus, and then it does mitosis. So now you have two nuclei inside one cell. When does cytokinesis happen? Remember? Prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, cytokinesis, right? The last, the last part. So what is cytokinesis? Do you guys remember? The separation of the two molecules. Yeah, it's the, it's the last step where the one big cell is getting longer, right? As you go into telophase, and then it goes whoop into two. Okay, that's cytokinesis. So Calorpa does the nuclear division part, the mitosis part, but it never does cytokinesis. So you end up with these huge leaves that look like fern leaves, up to three meters long. That's like ten feet, you guys. One cell, thousands of nuclei. It's just an interesting um, strategy to think about why, why or how some people do that. So those are a couple of interesting-ish, uh, as interesting as chlorophyte algae can get, uh, I suppose. All right, let's see. Let's talk about amoeba. Amoebazoa um, is an interesting group as well, I think. I don't know if we're into that kind of thing. There's your typical amoebazoan that you would think about seeing in the lab, perhaps single cell and sort of uh, just, a, just a, a single cell organism, right? Um, it's known for the little pseudopodia that it makes. So it's a cell that changes shape a lot to move. 
if it makes me roll false feet or that's what pseudopodia means um to move around and indulge things so it involves speaking it's a heterotrophic it's not an autotroph um the really interesting species that we'll talk about in this particular group are slime molds and yes i do think slime molds are interesting um mostly because of their behavior i don't know if you guys have ever seen this stuff growing in your yard but it looks like dog vomit that's another kind of vomit that's what it's called that's its common name the dog vomit slime mold Heliocephalia. Um, it is a plasmodial slime mold. These guys are large unicellular multinucleate, like Calerba, right? One big cell with lots of nuclei. Um, and it has two different stages the feeding stage, where it, like the blob, just moves across the surface of whatever substrate it's on, perhaps your yard or your garden. Um, feeding stuff, just engulfing food particles as it moves along. But when food gets scarce and resources become limited, um, it's time to reproduce. So you'll see that pattern in a lot of different organisms where growth and development occur when food is uh, plentiful. But then as soon as food becomes a limiting resource, it triggers reproduction. Because if you're not going to make it, then you put all of your resources into reproducing so that you can still carry out your genes. Does that make sense? So sometimes reproduction is the last stage of your life in certain organisms because it's sort of like um, save, not save yourself, but pass it on, I guess, so to speak. Um, so in the reproductive stage, it changes from this sort of uh, blob looking appearance into like a net like appearance, um, makes spores, and that's how it reproduces through spores. And there's a video, I'm not going to make you guys watch it, but you can click on it and look at what slime molds look like when it does that um, change of life stage. I'm not going to make you guys watch this video either, but take a look at it because it's actually kind of interesting. Um, this is a cellulose slime node called Dictyostilium. Same strategy, but instead of being plasmodial, one big cell, these are individual cellular organisms, single cells that live independently as single cell organisms, again, when food is plentiful. So when nutrients become uh, the limiting factor, they also go into the reproductive phase. But this time, they do something really weird where they morph into one big structure, okay? So you have all these single cells, cellular slime molds, living their own life, right? And then as soon as it gets, as soon as they get hungry and they realize now it's time to reproduce, they start uh, morphing together, okay? And then some of them become these stalks, part of this stalk, it grows up a little bit higher. Now we're not talking high, we're talking high for a slime mold, so still pretty low to the ground, by getting some elevation, okay? So some of these individual cells contribute to the formation of these stalks. And then others go into the formation of this spore forming body or this fruiting body at the top, which is the, the part of the organism that's gonna actually make spores, which are gonna be the babies essentially for the next generation. So they sacrifice their independence and they sacrifice themselves because those that become part of the stalk will not reproduce. Right? They're just going to be part of that stalk. It's only the guys who end up at the top as part of this orandium or this fruiting body that will actually reproduce and make new spores that will be carried on. So it is another example of sort of weird uh, colonial or cooperative behavior between single cell organisms at the cost of the individual for the good of passing the genes on forward to the next generation, which is really just interesting to me because it seems very complex for a single cell organism to think like that. Um, what's even weirder is that these guys can do things like learn how to move through a maze. Okay, interested in that? I got a video. I mean, link it. It's like a PDF special, and I think it's like an hour and a half long. So you guys are really interested. If you want to watch slime mold move through a maze, shoot me an email. I'll send you the link. All right, we're killing it, you guys. One more group. The last group is easy because it's where we live. Okay, and that's really all you have to know about the opisthocons. Okay, so opisthoconta, this is that group we were talking about. It's got fungi in it, it's got animals in it, and it's got our two closest, uh, each, I should say, respectively, closest groups of protists, the nucleares and the coenus of So what I want you to know about this group is basically that. Okay, that this this is where we are, we are opisthocons. Um there's some similarities between this morphology of the coenoflagellates 
in cells called coenzymes and sponges. When we get to animals, we'll look at this in more detail. So inside of the gastrovascular cavity of a sponge, which is by far the simplest of the animals, um, there are cells called coenocytes that are that function in fit filter feeding, and they look really similar to free living coenoflagellates. So it's just morphological similarity, but it's that relationship between coenoflagellates and animals is also supported by molecular systematics. Okay, so um, that's what I want you to know there. Unicellular sisters of, of multicellular animals, then you got the nucleoids that are the same for the fungi. So that's all you got to know about it. Okay. I know that's a lot. And I know it's a lot of scientific names. You're sort of like blazing over. Um, take it in chunks. All right. Work with one group at a time. I just got maybe make flashcards. Do people make flashcards anymore? Do you guys use those like flashcards for old people? Right? My insect card. There's actually something to that. Writing something does different things in your brain than typing something. So if Quizlet isn't doing it for you, try old school index cards. They're like a dollar for a pack of 100 index cards. Throw it out there. Okay, last thing in this chapter, beneficial produce. We spend a lot of time talking about produce that do terrible things, like rot potatoes and cause a million people to starve to death, or uh, cause malaria, or crazy cat lady syndrome. Right, but I told you with each of the, with, each, with each of these groups, we'll talk about some of the bad stuff, and then we'll talk about good stuff as well. So the last thing we'll talk about are what products do beneficially in the ecosystem. Um, some of this is review. So produce play critical ecological roles in the oceans and other ecosystems because a lot of them are plankton. Okay, so a lot of them provide food for larger, more complex heterotrophic organisms. Um, which is really important for, again, food pyramids, food chain type stuff. Um, primary producer, those are just, that's just another term for photosynthesis, photosynthetic organisms. We are pretty far up in the trophic pyramid, right, in the food chain. What do we eat? Like whatever we want, right? But everything that we eat came from something that ate something that came from a photosynthetic organism or a primary producer. So these guys are important, as I mentioned, as, as the base of the food chain, not because we eat plankton, but other small organisms eat plankton that are then eaten by larger organisms that then we eat. Yes, so things like that. Okay. Um, there are also quite a few decomposers. We talked about the importance of decomposition with prokaryotes, bacteria that break down organic material, waste materials, um, other dead organisms. Without decomposers, all of your nutrients and energy are locked up in, in those tissues. Okay, so decomposition is a huge, um, important role in ecology. So they do both. They produce and they decompose different um, species of produce. Uh, let's see. Let's see talk about that. Um, we will revisit the example we later. This is a really specific example of a symbiotic relationship where you have a um, cytoflagellate called the Xanthaline that live inside of corals. Most people think corals are pretty cool. So we'll take a little visit to um, a picture of the Xanthaline here. Oh, you can't see it, sorry. It's, when I click that link, it takes me to the page here. Again, when we get to animals, we'll talk about corals. Is there animals? Did you guys know that? Corals are called coral reefs, they're actually animals. Um, but so, as animals, they're heterotrophs. All animals have to eat stuff. None of us are photosynthetic. Um, and that includes corals. So, corals uh, harvest and sort of hang on to these little tiny dinoflagellates called the dentine that live inside of the tissue. So this is sort of a zoomed out window. It's a little portion of this coral, one coral polyp. Um, they're greenish because they're photosynthetic, but they live inside the tissue of the coral and they feed the coral. It's endo endosymbiosis. They live inside of the coral, but they are um, living symbiotically, right? They have a cooperative relationship. So they eventually get a nice place to live, protected, um, sort of the habitat inside of the coral and the coral gets food in return. Is a pretty good relationship. Um, unfortunately, when coral gets stressed, which they do really easily by things like changes in the water temperature or changes in the pH, um, they kick these guys out. They push them out of their tissues. And we scientists don't really understand why yet. Um, but as a reaction to that environmental stress, they push these guys out. But these guys are where they're getting their food. 
So then the coral die. That's coral bleaching. You guys ever heard of coral bleaching as a problem for coral reef systems? Um, that has to do with these zooxanthellae. So that's just an interesting, uh, very specific benefit, species specific, or at least um, genus specific. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. I do want to introduce the term saprobe. So the saprobe is another name for a decomposer. Okay, so saprobic organisms feed on dead organisms or waste matter, return nutrients to the soil. I like what we've been talking about. Yeah, those are um, ecological level benefits that um, Coda speak for us as well. So they're not all bad. Cool. Um, why, you might ask, is there a termite on here? I forgot to take it off. But they have um, gut micro or gut um, um, protists that live in their intestines and help them digest wood. So termites alone can't eat wood. They have to have internal endosymbiotic protists that have the enzymes to digest the um, wood. Without them, they couldn't do it. But there are no words. <laughs> there are no words on the slide about this. I just got some epic talk. Just another example. All right, protists, right? I'm tired. That's a lot. You guys tired too? Yeah. This chapter, um, I kind of, I kind of love this chapter, and I kind of don't because the first half is really interesting with endosymbiosis, but we're not even going to get into that until next week when we really start discussing it for our class discussion. That part is really critical uh, going forward because it's the theory of how eukaryotes evolve. Right, it's a really significant, major, fundamental concept in this course, and then the second half is just a list. Right, of organisms. So it's sort of two two sides of uh, two styles in the same chapter. Um, so yeah, a lot of this is just looking at the list of, of organisms and their characteristics and sort of the stuff. All right, let's do um, a kahoot real quick before we wrap up. The kahoot is over uh, microorganisms, so prokaryotes and viruses. So we're actually taking a step back to think about what we've talked about up to this point. Because if we did a cahoot right now on protus, nobody would get anything, right? Because you just heard it and you haven't had a chance to digest it. Mm, let's see if we can do this in 10 minutes. I think we can. Not sure why I'm not doing songs again. I love the songs. Should be playing. Oh, there we go. Doesn't that make it better? Anybody trying to get in still? Right, Quick review microorganisms. Which of the following groups are not prokaryotes? Good. So more, more got it than didn't. Um, protists. This is always tricky because prokaryotes and protists, for some reason, in your head, just go together. Right? But why is that? Why are protists not prokaryotes? Because all protists are what? Eukaryotes, right? That's really the only thing protists have in common with each other overall is that they're all eukaryotes. Good. 
All right, bacteria and archaea share all of the following characteristics except for one. Which one do they not share in common? Good, yeah. Um, the identical cell membrane structure. Remember, that's one of the major things that separates them is that chemical composition of their cell membrane or their cell wall. Awesome. Okay, term for an organism that is capable of causing disease in another organism. We've thrown this one around quite a bit. Yeah, pathogen. Good. Um, so are prions pathogens? Do you guys know what prions are? Yeah, they are. What about archaea? Not that we know of. Good. All of these contribute to the formation of antibiotic resistance in bacteria, except for Or is it all of the above? It's all of the above. Yeah, you can you can contribute to the rise of the antibiotic resistance through any of those means. Using prokaryotes to remove pollutants and help clean up the environment. It's called what? Yeah, bioremediation. Yeah, bacterial cleansing would work too, but the better term is bioremediation. The first photosynthetic organisms on the planet were they cyanobacteria, green algae, aerobic archaea, or red algae? First photosynthetic organisms. Yeah, can't trick you guys, cyanobacteria. Um, green algae is kind of a tricky one because uh, oftentimes people call cyanobacteria blue green algae, but they're not actually algae because algae are what? Protists, eukaryotes. Good. Process by which bacteria convert atmospheric nitrogen into a biologically useful form. Fixation, same as we talked about with carbon fixation, just changing um, an inorganic form of, a, of an element into something that you can use bi uh, biologically. Good. The protein coat that is coated by the viral genome. This was a couple of chapters ago. The protein coat is actually pictured on here, but it's just called protein coat, so it doesn't take away. Good. What are capsomeres? Yeah, the individual proteins make it up that capsule. Good. Viruses that are specific to bacterial hosts are referred to as retroviruses, bacterial viruses, bacterial phages, or vector viruses. Good. Bacteriophage or phage for short. Two more. Transfer of DNA fragments from one prokaryote to another via a pylon. Yeah, conjugation. That on all three of these, transduction, transformation, and conjugation were all in the same slide because there are all three ways that gene transfer between bacteria and archaea can happen. The conjugation specifically refers to the uh, formation of that pilus that connects the two cells. Last one, a bacterium that lives in hydrothermal vents and uses hydrogen sulfide for energy and CO2 from the water to make sugar. Choose your metabolism. Pilus. 
Okay, that may be something to go back and look at. TiVo autotrophs, because where is the energy coming from? Yeah, the H2S, right? The um, hydrogen sulfide. So it's chemical energy, not light energy. Um, and it's an autotroph because it's using CO2 from the water to make its own sugar, it's not using other stuff to make it a chemo heterotroph. Uh, what's an example of a chemo heterotroph? Us. Yeah, we have to use chemical energy and we get carbon from eating stuff. Good. Just a quick review. You guys did great. Gives you some idea of the type of questions that you'll see going forward.